So, um, we heard about this morning about a lot of uh, radiocarbon and the results that has been uh, produced uh, in, uh, during this uh, project. So, I'm going to present, uh, you know, um, our, our methods uh, uh, for, to build the chronology. So, um, archaeology is a combination of uh, chronology, geography, and cultural material. And this has to be uh, integrated in order to understand uh, the past. Um, many schemes are uh, used uh, to, to show these three parameters. Uh, here you have, for example, one side, this is the time, linear, of course. Here we have the geography with different countries and sites. And the cultural materials is represented with different names. That's uh, very impressive, and schemes uh, are given in different form. But I think one important aspect in this scheme is, uh, you know, time, uh, as we have seen uh, today with radiocarbon, we are able to give uncertainty and errors uh, when we determine the time. So these numbers so precise uh, when we actually measure are not so uh, thin and so... But also the uh, geography, this is less uh, uh, prone to errors because the site is where it is. But material culture is very much uh, connected to interpretation. And these uh, straight line uh, that uh, sometimes they looks like you know, synchronous uh, between the sites, they should be, of course, uh, to be more uh, fuzzy, more uh, um, less, uh, less uh, well-defined. Of course, this is a scheme, and the scheme is useful uh, because it helps us uh, to put things uh, in, uh, in order and see where we are missing data, we are missing uh, uh, some, uh, some information. So let's focus on the, on the radiocarbon now. And uh, you know that recently a new calibration curve uh, came uh, out uh, in the 2020. And uh, there, are there are some changes which are mostly in the very old ages, uh, 30, 40,000, 50,000 years. Um, but for this time of period, uh, like in the early Bronze Age, now I overlap uh, the 2013 curve, uh, and you see that the difference is really very small. You almost don't see much difference. But the problem of the calibration curve remains because we have, you know, wiggles like this one, we have uh, plateaus, like this one, but we have also very nice, uh, very sharp uh, uh, slope, and these are our uh, uh, best uh, candidate for chronology. And of course, uh, uh, these tell us that uh, a site which is dated with one date uh, is not very useful, you know, it just gives you, because one date could take uh, all these uh, wiggles. But, um, so, the best is to have a very tiny, um, very dense uh, um, stratigraphy so that, uh, for example, if we are in this type of uh, wiggle, if we have uh, many layers and we date them, then we can indeed follow these uh, wiggles and figure out that even if uh, I have a date which uh, is uh, younger than this one, Except, uh, for example, for the radiocarbon, this would be younger, would be older, sorry, than this one, but in fact, in the calibrated one, it is younger. So, you know, these are things that has to be considered when you start to plan your chronology, because uh, uh, the density of your layers uh, is uh, super important when you have uh, this wiggle matching. And this is the classical example of uh, Megiddo that we have uh, published, that indeed uh, we have dates uh, like this one, which was older than all the rest, but uh, you know, it was in the stratigraphy, it was uh, higher, and so it had to be younger. And because we had uh, many dates, uh, one after the other, then we could uh, cut uh, and follow this wiggle matching uh, with our sediments. And this is something that uh, announced a lot your precision and accuracy in the, calibra in the chronology. This is uh, the plot of uh, Anna Paula when she did her uh, uh, master on uh, the chronology of the Caucasus. Uh, and you know, it just shows you uh, a beautiful uh, rainbow. You know, the, colors, uh, the colors are our, our uh, cultural remains, so it's easy. This is another way to represent uh, chronology and cultural changes. 
And, uh, you know, if you would like to have, uh, like, uh, you know, a sequence of uh, phases, a cultural phases, that's very complicated. You see immediately that we have uh, overlap uh, of dates. <coughs> and also, in, in one site where you have a sequence, uh, you know, you have uh, the Curaraxe 1, the Curaraxe 2, and you have uh, the, the um, I can't see here, yeah, the early Kurgan 1, then, uh, you know, you see that uh, the dates are very scant, and you have uh, also uh, Curaraxe 2 that uh, uh, bridge the Curaraxe 1, something that uh, wouldn't be uh, really understandable. Then uh, you have uh, this type uh, of dates, which are out of context, in a sense, and these are these outliers that are very easy to identify. But uh, are indeed outliers? What do they tell us, these outliers? That uh, the date uh, is what it is, and the cultural association uh, is, is, uh, is not in agreement. So we have to learn about uh, this, uh, this type uh, of uh, outliers. So we have uh, problems, and if you try to make uh, a, a, a synchronism between all these sites, it will be very difficult. And Bayesian analysis is not going to help you very much, except to making you waiting for hours and hours until the model is, uh, is finished. And you will find a huge amount of outliers, which are, of course, you always find outliers in the boundaries. Because uh, if you put a boundary and you say, has to be like here, for example, the yellow has to be before the red, then uh, where do you put the boundary? Here, here, here. So this is what uh, uh, a, a, an excellent stratigraphy and many dates may help you to resolve this type of question in the chronology. So to build a chronology in, uh, as we, we, we see in, uh, in, in our group at, uh, at the Weizmann Institute, you know, is, uh, is putting together three different uh, and independent uh, um, uh, variables. Is the archaeological context for C14 samples is, uh, which uh, is not the pottery context, uh, is the archaeological context for C14. And then you have uh, the material quality. No? Not all the charcoals are the same, not all the bones are the same, not all the um, pretreatment uh, are the same. And then you also have your uh, AMS determination, which is, you know, it's not a machine. It's not an AMS. There is a, there is a lot of work behind that. Uh, and uh, that you have to control this machine. It's not a press the button uh, measurement. Now, all these three variables, uh, you know, even if you do your experiment uh, with all the parameters under control, can provide you, at the best, uh, you know, 5% outliers. This will be according to statistics. And if each of these give you the 5% of outlier, which doesn't have to be the same samples and the same numbers, then you end with 15% outliers. So you measure 10 samples, and then you will have uh, a lot of samples uh, uh, which are not uh, reliable in your chronology. So all these variables, all these parameters, the context, the material, and the EMS, has to be under control in order to build a reliable, accurate, and precise chronology. Context uh, and here is uh, probably one of the uh, we are one of the few groups that work in the field when we build uh, a chronology and we check our uh, context for the radiocarbon and you know there are contexts which are uh, <laughs> there are by any 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 doubt or the best and if your jar is full of seeds then you can't be wrong in this case fine and uh, but most of the time your contest is something like that. Not uh, really uh, uh, very apparent. Uh, you have to guess what you have, and you have to assume according to your uh, um, experience. If this is a fireplace, or just uh, um, an intrusive, uh, or excavated before uh, from the next uh, layer. So it is quite complicated. But if you find here, for example, some charcoal, some seeds, are they good for dating? Do they? Do, are they connected to this floor, to this uh, surface? And this is something that uh, by eyes is very difficult to see, and you need a special tools. So you may use you know, all the microscopic uh, parameters like uh, pseudomorphs, which represent here the pseudomorphs, represent uh, your uh, presence of uh, ash. You have a phytolith for the fewer. And we use a lot of the infrared spectroscopy. So uh, when we are in Israel, uh, and if we can, we bring the lab do in the excavation, and so we can, while we are excavating, uh, and we can check 
what the context is, what it represents from a microscopic point of view using uh, uh, binoculars, apretographic, uh, we can do some basic chemistry, and here is our infrared. And the infrared is uh, essential in order to understand uh, not only the context but also the material because through this analysis, uh, which is the interaction of the light uh, with the molecules uh, of your material, uh, in this case would be the so-called archaeological sediments, uh, you identify the, those sediments. You can see if you have a phytolith uh, included in your sediments, uh, if you have organic material through the phosphate uh, peaks, uh, these are the peaks uh, of the phosphate molecule, and the infrared will tell you. And if you have a calcite, which is, uh, represent many different uh, um, uh, activities, it could be ash, it could be plaster, and we have developed also the, the methods so to see how, how this uh, calcite is related to uh, anthropological activity or it's just a geological uh, calcite. And uh, very important uh, because we are looking uh, very much at uh, uh, charred remains for radiocarbon. Uh, we have seen you know, this morning uh, seeds and, um, and the charcoal. Uh, the temperature at which uh, uh, the fire was done uh, and left us uh, these uh, charred remains is recorded by the clay. And the clay, when it is heated, uh, change. Uh, and we can detect uh, the changes uh, with the infrared spectroscopy by, for example, the disappearing of the water peaks, uh, the, the structural water peaks, uh, or the SiO, the silicon oxide peak here, the 530, disappear as the temperature increase, here is the increasing in temperature. And also the peak of the clay, which starts at uh, wave number uh, 1032, we see that it moves uh, to 1092. So these changes tell us the temperature that your clay has seen. So, and if you find your, uh, char your uh, charred remains together with clay uh, that has seen temperature, then you you may build a more a higher confidence that this charcoal, this seeds, has been burnt, burnt in situ there. And this, by dating the seed, then you can date the surface on which the fire has taken place. So this is what we did uh, also by analyzing uh, uh, the other microscopic uh, um, uh, proxy for fire and for fuel and anthropological uh, activity. So this build up what we call it the, um, the radiocarbon assemblage uh, for burning features, for example. In Aradetis, when we started to excavate uh, uh, during the master of Anna Paola, you know, we incur in uh, one locus, uh, which you know, we see something that there was a fireplace. And uh, by sampling uh, different uh, sediments, uh, uh, both uh, where the features we see changes and where it also the general sediments for control, then we figure out uh, that, uh, for example, the sample 24, close to where our charcoal is here, has indeed uh, the features in the infrared here we see that has been burnt at 700 degrees, a seed temperature at 700 degrees, because we don't have uh, the peak at 520, the water peaks are gone, uh, and our clay peak also moved to 1040. So this tells us that this charcoal might have been burned there. And by excavating below that, then we found the structure that was probably burned at the same time as our first appearance on, uh, on the locus uh, above, just a few centimeters above. So, you know, you, you build your uh, archaeological uh, um, confidence that these materials is indeed in situ. Now, observe in this, uh, okay, you see, these are the numbers of the sample that we measure and are in couple, because this we relate now to the material that we wanted uh, to date. So, having characterized this, and you see this is the sampling that we do in the field, uh, because you not only have to sample the material that you think has been burnt, but you also have to uh, sample material around to see that your feature is unique and not a general, uh, uh, something general all over the site, all over the tail. So it's a real signal. Say that uh, now the material quality for C14. 
The fact that you see a bone doesn't mean that there is collagen, and the fact that you see a seed doesn't mean that you can measure it for C14, because diagenesis and changes through the thousand and thousand of years may completely destroy your initial C14, uh, the material that contains your C14 for dating. And you have to be aware that by standing, uh, stay in the sediments, uh, you have uh, humic substances that can carry younger carbon into your sample. Clay, that can be either younger or older in carbon. Carbonate, again, it can be younger or older. And all these have carbon inside, and if you don't get rid of it, uh, um, and you are not left with the, the material, the original material, then uh, your data can be different. And, uh, you know, this uh, can be followed. We, we study uh, quite intensively the charcoal because it's not a material forever. And when you do your chemistry for cleaning uh, your charcoal, you know, you first, uh, this, is a, this is a charcoal from the excavation. It's 10,000 years old, this charcoal. And you have the peak uh, of your charcoal. As you clean uh, from the carbonate with the chlorhydric acid, uh, and then from the humic acid with your uh, uh, sodium hydroxide, okay, and you follow and you check your material, how it changes uh, through the chemistry, you see that the region of your uh, charcoal, which is this one, completely disappeared. Your molecules that initially were your charcoal, uh, you have uh, cleaned it because it's so badly preserved that it's gone. And you are left uh, then uh, with your clay, and your quartz. Quartz doesn't have carbon, but clay has carbon. And this sample had enough carbon to be measurable with an accelerator mass spectrometer. So, but the dates uh, is totally wrong. And in our dates, uh, we had exactly this effect. We were following uh, how much we can clean from the clay in our dates, uh, in the Kuraraxe layers. And we saw that in some cases, you know, again, we got rid of the charcoal and left only with the clay. And this, in, differently from another sample, which has uh, uh, the beautiful peaks of the charcoal. And when we dated, uh, we took uh, several couples of these samples and we dated because we wanted to see um, the effect. If, uh, if we would have made this mistake and dated this sample, what could be the effect? You know, if you move by 300 years, easy to find out that that's wrong. But if you move, like we saw, by 20 years or 50 years, that's really dangerous. That, as precise you can measure with your accelerator, plus minus 20, you will be definitely very wrong. Much more wrong than if you would have measured for 300 years older or younger, because that's easy to find out this mistake. You see, the red one, uh, these red uh, spectra, are uh, the dates uh, obtained from samples, exactly the same material as uh, this one, exactly the same, but uh, we left uh, there the clay. And sometimes, you see, it's almost at uh, the same age, but sometimes uh, it's very different like here and here. So, and this depends probably from the quantity of the clay, it depends from the amount of organic inside the clay. And if uh, these are ordered in stratigraphic sequence, uh, these samples, you know, you would say, well, this is my data and this is all wood effect. Is older this data and because it's charcoal, all wood effect problem. And you would consider actually this one, which is the wrong one, as your best date. And if you try to make your transition okay, in between one culture and the other, you move, you see, these are 100 years. You would have moved your transition by 100 or 200 years later. And you will be very wrong. So now, you understand that uh, uh, this uh, quality of the material uh, is, is super important and that there are parameters that we check in order to find out that the material is indeed clean. The infrared, we before, before we measure any samples, we check with the infrared. If the material is not clean, we don't date. This was an exercise that we wanted to see how much we could be wrong and it's really very dangerous. Then we go to the accelerator, which, uh, you know, uh, 
for the accelerator, you, you have to transform uh, your material after you clean it in uh, graphite. And when you transform in graphite, uh, then you can measure the percentage of carbon in your material. Why this is important? I need, after all, I need one milligram of carbon. But this milligram of carbon has to be the right milligram, uh, as small as it, as it is. And the percentage of carbon tells me if uh, my charcoal is fine. It should be 50, 60 percent the carbon. And if you don't check this, if you don't pay attention to this detail, then you know you have enough material for a measurement. But the measurement could be wrong. Collagen has to be 30 percent in carbon. Collagen with less, even if you have the material, would not be collagen. You have something else there. And then we check it with the stable isotopes and CN ratio according to the type of material. Then uh, when you have your milligram, uh, your milligram of carbon uh, has to go in the ion source, uh, where you have uh, from the ion source, uh, then uh, you will take uh, out all the single carbon atoms uh, and uh, you measure the ratio of C12, C13, and C14. Again, if you are going to measure, and this is something that we pay attention for our application, for our research uh, in chronology, if I have uh, a, a, a chronology which uh, is only in the third millennium BC, then uh, all the samples I put here, the standards, the known age samples, are in that time range because it is important for the curious and precision that you actually check the, those plus minus 20 years. You, we don't mix a sample for 50,000 years uh, with a chronology of 1,000 years old. So the preparation of this wheel uh, is uh, set uh, in order to achieve uh, the best uh, accuracy and precision for the chronology we are investigating. And, uh, and it's not a routine. We may decide uh, to a certain point that uh, for our uh, chronology, we need 20 measurements in each sample, and not 10. I mean, more measurement means more time. More time means that you can measure less uh, samples uh, in the same amount of time. And this uh, is very uh, time consuming uh, without uh, considering the cost uh, of all the operation and so on. So this is important because you want to get the right number at the end. So now you understand that uh, when we get the accelerator, I call it uh, the step of no return. When the sample is measured, the number has to be out. So because we have checked the contest, we have checked the material, we have checked all the parameters, when we get the accelerator and we set the measurement for the C14, you know, with all the different, uh, and, uh, different uh, um, uh, parameters that could change to the measurement. If you, if you have never seen or never been in an, in an accelerator, we don't measure once the sample. We do 10 or 20 measurements in a sequence with all the samples for three minutes each time. So each sample is measured half an hour in general. But if needed, we can measure longer, more times. And all these numbers, you have uh, 20 different numbers only for uh, the age, but this comes from the current that you measure here and the currents that you measure here and all the vacuum parameters. So all this is recorded and at the end, uh, when you check, uh, you see, when you see all your numbers like that, if you have a sample which behave like this, that's there is a problem. And sometimes it happens, it happens that you have problem. Again, I can measure an average here with the standard deviation, I can calculate. But these samples is not, is not a sample that behaved correctly as these samples. So these things need to be checked in all, but rem remember that mathematics, you can always calculate an average and the standard deviation. So at the end, uh, you know, after all these numbers and all these, uh, you get to your uh, Libby age, uh, which is, you know, related to the content of C14, and now is only the calibration that separates us uh, from understanding our uh, archaeological record. So, when we started with this plot uh, from the beginning, 
Now I understand that with Anna Paola, when we tried to make any models, it was very complicated, very difficult, because how many of these dates are from in situ context? How many are from pristine uh, materials and can be comparable with what we are doing today? And uh, was the carbon percentage checked? Or, you know, because uh, once you had to measure, you just measure and this is it. So, you know, all these, uh, all these are uh, important uh, in order to build uh, your coherent uh, chronology and stratigraphy uh, uh, of your site. Then, uh, when you have uh, many dates, uh, and the best is to have it from one site, that's the easiest part uh, when you have to do a model, because you have uh, all under control, and if the stratigraphy is one on the top of the other, that's, uh, you know, it couldn't be uh, better than this. Then you can use your uh, um, model. And remember, the model is a model. It helps you to make order to see where you can ask a more precise question or where you can have a problem or a gap. But uh, you see, there is no, no reason why the model has decided that this is the right date. What about this part? This part has been excluded in the model. Why? It could be that actually my date, the correct one, is actually here. Who is Bayesian to tell me where my date is? So now you have to use your uh, uh, understanding of the archaeological site, of the cultural remains, uh, and figure out if this is only an effect of the mathematics, because I want everything to be as short as possible. I want uh, this give me the shortest period uh, my level has survived. But there is no reason in the world that uh, there couldn't be a gap between this and my next uh, real date. Now, site formation processes, understanding, uh, uh, seeing uh, if there was a gap, uh, that's why I'm asking also before the gap, is very important. And the more dates you do, the better you understand also your sites uh, in, uh, in this level. But remember, a model is, uh, is helping you. And all the models are wrong, but some are less wrong than others or more useful than others. So it is not my quote, but uh, is, is a model. And you see, when you do a model, this is from Anna Paola work, always the outliers is when you want to make a transition. Who is the first, who is the last, who is the one that change? But there is no reason why there shouldn't be an overlap. And why to put it in a sequence? Maybe it's a phase, maybe all these dates are the same. So now the mathematics uh, is helping you to make order and uh, help you to find out uh, uh, where to focus. And I think, uh, I, I think I'm almost uh, at the end. I think that there is a beautiful paper by uh, Christopher Bronkramsey, who is uh, the one that wrote uh, the Oxcal uh, that we use. Uh, and it's about the dealing with the outliers and the offsets in radiocarbon dating. Uh, I, I would like everybody to read this paper. And, uh, and you see, he say in general, there are two main ways of dealing with outliers. The first is to try to identify all the outliers and then eliminate them manually from the analysis. If this is possible, if this is possible, this is probably the best approach since it is then entirely clear what data are being used to support the analysis. There is also a routine, the outlier analysis, that we can use. And you leave the Bayesian to decide um, who is the, the outlier in your analysis. But I think that once you publish all the data and you show all the data you have obtained, then you are entitled by knowing uh, uh, your site, uh, the, the, the archaeology, to say, well, to my best understanding, those are the outliers. Once the data are published, then everybody can make another model, can build another, uh, uh, another scenario and so on. But uh, I think that really getting to the, to the core of why a number is not in the right place, why a date is not in the right place, is super important. And I, I think that in my career, I learned much more from the outliers 
why they're not where I was supposed, where I expected to be, then from the beautiful uh, sequence uh, that, uh, you know, just agree with my view. I think that the outliers has the most informative, uh, um, are the most informative in your research. So in conclusion, I think precision accuracy in the chronology start in the field and it needs microarchaeology tools and methods for the selection of the best adaptable context. This is, uh, if you don't get the right context, then uh, nothing. The accelerator can be the best in the world, but uh, you know, if, the, if the context is wrong, uh, we can't save it. Material and analysis requires tailored analytical methods, pretreatment, FTIR, C percentage, Types of standards and known age samples according to the type of chronology we are investigating. And this is to control and eliminate contamination on one side, which is uh, somehow independent from us, and the noise that can, be, uh, that can source from this. Attention to the calibration curve. That's important in order to plan the density of your dates. If you are in a plateau, then you have to do a lot of dates to cut the plateau according to stratigraphy. If you are in a beautiful slope, then maybe two dates, top and bottom of your slope, might be enough to, to define if you are there or not. Bayesian analysis is helpful in integrating the stratigraphy, cultural material, and time. It is really very helpful. But be aware of the artifacts that can be created and produced by this analysis. So at the end, you have always to be the one that uh, interpret uh, this, uh, uh, this model. And I think uh, that uh, um, I finish with this one, and I thank you for the attention, and I thank you Eugenia Mintz and Lior Regev, which are my partners uh, in research for all the chronology, the accelerator, and the lab at the Weizmann Institute. Uh, without them, uh, that would not be possible, and all the students and other people that work to build up all this, uh, this idea of a chronology with radiocarbon. Thank you very much.